It's among the most repressive and isolated, brutally authoritarian places in the whole world. It's a hermit kingdom that's ruled with an iron fist. Now, for decades, Asia and North Korea has existed under the control of a ruthless dictatorship. And every man, every woman, every child inside its borders is subject to a totalitarian set of policies, constant threat of execution, routine forced disappearances, near omnipresent surveillance and social control, and a hard labor system that is deeply integrated into everyday life. Presided over by a dynasty of eccentric despots, secure in its place under the patronage of China, and sitting smugly on one side of a long nuclear standoff with its southern neighbor and the western world as well. North Korea is an anomaly. And it's an anomaly, not in a good way. It's an anomaly in all the worst ways. So when a person is actually able to escape from North Korea, this is a feat of desperate bravery that simply can't be ignored. Every year, hundreds of North Koreans catch a lucky break, defecting to South Korea or to neighboring China, in the hopes of finding a better life. But the question we want to answer today is how? How do they do it? How does a person who's subject to constant surveillance in their community, knowing that they're likely to be shot dead on the spot if they're ever found trying to escape, make the decision to flee anyway? And when they do, how on earth can they possibly succeed? All right, before we can even consider what it's like to try and escape from North Korea, we do need to at least try and put into perspective what it's actually like to live in North Korea. Why would they want to escape? Just in case you don't know. Look, this is a place where Western media and popular conception tends to have an absolute field day where coverage of the wild and often nonsensical North Korean state produces truly eye-popping headlines. The North Koreans really told that their current leader, Kim Jong-un, learned to drive at the age of three, or that his father, Kim Jong-il, invented the hamburger under the uh, super catchy name, Double Bread with Meat. Does sound like something McDonald's would serve. Our foreign visitors really kept under constant surveillance, led around to dressed up destinations as if the country was a furniture showroom. Our entire generations of families really forced into imprisonment for the crimes of their forefathers. To the regime's elites in the capital city of Pyongyang really feast on lobster and escargot while many of their citizens suffer constant and unending famine. Well, the answer to those questions is, yeah, actually, I mean, all of that is is actually pretty accurate. And as bad as it all sounds, it's still only really a fraction of the story. You see, at present, North Korea runs what is known as a totalitarian government, one that's highly centralized among a single dictatorial authority. And that state aligns its citizens into complete subservience to the state itself. In a regime like this, concepts like individual speech, personal rights, individual or familial wealth, and basic privacy just don't exist people, their economic output, and the run of their individual lives are all oriented towards strengthening their state, even when strengthening the state comes at the detriment of that very individual. At a baseline, daily life for the average North Korean citizen is particularly difficult. With very little access to the internet, few cell phones in circulation, and unreliable access to things like power, heating, and food, North Koreans live in what is basically an undeveloped nation, with most of the country's 25 million people expected to work menial agricultural jobs. Clean water access is limited, roads are rare, state rations are hard to come by, and it's up to the average North Korean to work certain amounts of hours each day, fill their prescribed quotas, and make up the difference for their family's survival themselves. Financial incentives to work are just not a part of the equation for most of North Korea's citizens, and what currency-based trade does take place typically happens outside of the confines of a job. Malnutrition and poverty, they are just facts of life, and so too is a constant stream of propaganda coming from every direction. North Korean state media, local officials, and even one's own community, where performative loyalty to the state is just a prerequisite of being socially accepted. And that's when all things are going right. The other side of the coin for a totalitarian regime like this one is the often extreme disincentives that an ordinary person would face for stepping out of line. The list of things a person can't do in North Korea could absolutely fill a book. 
into better media is completely bad. So are trade and workers unions. Citizens are prohibited from joining or interacting with everyday organizations that aren't under direct state control. Freedom of expression, whether in one words, writings, or even dress, is absolutely prohibited. And so are basic rights, like freedom to assemble or freedom of religion. Rights or protections based on a person's age, race, gender, disability, just they don't exist. And even benevolent efforts to protect or support one's fellow citizens punished harshly if they take place outside of the strict confines of the state system. And then there's the matter of punishment in the police and surveillance state that reaches deeper into its citizens' lives than almost any other on earth. Just like basic liberties, like freedom of expression, don't exist, well neither does due process, and a person could have their fate completely written by North Korea's justice system, and we should really say justice system there. The state employs a sprawling system of political detention camps, labor camps, where anyone perceived to be an opponent of the regime can be tortured, worked to death, or starved in conditions that truly resemble the worst of the Nazi death camps of World War II. And yet again, and again, these are camps where someone can just be whisked away to in an instant for even the smallest threat or affront to the regime. The spectre of execution looms just as large with people deemed deserving of extrajudicial authority by the state basically free to kill, maim, and torture alleged dissenters as they see fit. In a situation like this, it's not hard to see why someone might just want to get the hell out of North Korea. Of course, we do have to acknowledge a good bit of nuance even within that statement. After all, North Korea works just as hard to justify its own actions to its citizens as it does to surveil or punish them. And with their only information on the outside world coming from the very regime itself, many North Koreans have no idea that the circumstances they face every day are even an issue. But those who do find out, whether via word of mouth or smuggled Western media or any other way, are sometimes motivated to do the unthinkable in order to survive. We're talking, of course, about the very subject of today's video, defection from North Korea itself. Uh, it's an interesting word, defection, but it is one that fits the situation in North Korea exceedingly well. In a military context, the defector is different from a deserter. A deserter is someone who simply runs away from their post or their responsibilities, while a defector is something more akin to a traitor, someone who chooses not to leave, but to go over to the other side. And as harsh as that term might seem when levied against an ordinary North Korean just trying to avoid starvation, it is in line with both how their regime and also the rest of the world see an attempt to escape. In the Hermit Kingdom, a place that the regime teaches is a perfect expression of humanity, almost preordained to be paradise on earth, if a person was to leave, then they're a traitor. And that's plain and simple. Now, defecting from North Korea is not impossible by a uh, long shot. Since the 1990s, some 35,000 people have been able to escape the regime in an attempt to start a new life elsewhere. But it is an act that comes with a severe risk, and even a risk to one's loved ones. In a country where North Koreans have been sentenced to decades of hard labor, or even killed for not appearing adequately distraught during annual periods of mourning for the country's two deceased former dictators, it's not hard to guess what would await a person who appears to be turning their back on the entire North Korean way of life. And the risks to one's family are known just as well. The families of North Korean defectors often face banishment, vilification, and even exile to some of the country's most remote and mountainous areas, regardless of the status that they might have had prior to a relative defecting. In the past, North Korea has amplified stories of the children of defectors being forced into hard labor in blast furnaces, or forcing grandparents into labor camps as punishment for their grandchildren's decision to leave. Even in the face of some incredibly harsh consequences, many North Koreans do choose to make a mad dash to the border, knowing that even the harshest reprisals would be a mere reflection of the circumstances that they face every day. A variety of studies claim that anywhere from 50 to 80 percent of people fleeing North Korea have witnessed at least one extreme trauma before trying to leave, be it a public execution, an act of torture, or maybe they just had to stay in a labor camp. Nine out of ten are diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder by the time they're evaluated in the South. And in those circumstances, we can get PTSD? Well, we'd probably want to get the hell out too. Alright, so if you're gonna bust out of North Korea, there are two basic paths that you can take the southward one to South Korea or the northward route into China. 
both options do present a whole other set of issues but before we even get there we've got to discuss the powerful opposing forces at work around the border china and in many ways south korea want to keep defectors out and north korea also wants to keep them in first there's the north korean side of the equation we've already talked about just how pervasive the north korean surveillance state is but we've got to talk a little bit about more of the specifics of how this works in this particular country social control is an exceptionally powerful tool to keep order that is to say not just the north korean government but its entire society is arranged in a way meant to keep people in line ordinary citizens are heavily incentivized to do what they're told is their patriotic duty that is to report any signs of dissent from friends neighbors or even family members workplaces small towns communities and even neighborhood associations are built with surveillance in mind from omnipresent trusted government representatives to regime trained minders in the factories and the fields this sort of community cohesion makes it incredibly difficult to find the knowledge and resources that a person needs in order to defect talk to a neighbor about it and there's no telling whether they'll slip your cell phone to contact a smuggler or report you to the local authorities call the number on a pamphlet you found on the ground advertising border trafficking services and you might well be ringing up a central intelligence division in pyongyang with no internet service no way to anonymously contact someone or build an alias and no way to know where a person's loyalties lie getting out is generally either a solo venture or one that requires extraordinary luck in order to succeed and even if someone does work out what they'd need to do in order to escape getting out of one's community is a whole other problem for elites and everyday people alike a person's community will know them inside and out see them many times a day and often check them off a list to make sure that they're showing up for work and doing what they're supposed to in general it's easier for a woman to escape the north than a man most of the time women in north korea are not formally employed and have no boss to check in with every day running the household in their own communities they typically have somewhat more time to make their escape although for everyone in north korea it's only a matter of time before someone realizes that they have gone so by now it should go without saying that if a person is captured while trying to defect they are going to face extremely harsh consequences inside north korea but even if they manage to try and sneak to the border through the dead of night they're almost always in extreme danger pyongyang and its soldiers abide by shoot to kill orders for anyone spotted trying to flee orders that have only gotten stronger with time inside north korea in the past these orders have extended only to people running towards south korea but now those who flee to china are subject to the same policy since 2020 north korea has also been creating and widening a so-called buffer zone on their own territory stretches of land approaching the border where anyone found there without permission can just be shot then and there and if a north korean does manage to slip past their own country's guards those who choose to attempt a direct run to south korea place themselves in massive peril even beyond the north korean snipers who will be looking for them a defector then comes upon the korean demilitarized zone dmz heavily patrolled on both sides the dmz is the no man's land that divides the two modern korean nations and it's seen as the most likely route for either country to try and invade the other if that reality were ever to come to pass as a result it's been heavily fortified with some two million landmines scattered across the landscape and civilians need special documentation to even come close to it three quarters of a million north korean troops are deployed within 100 kilometers of the dnz as are almost half a million south koreans and 20,000 americans on the southern side of the 38th parallel making the risk of apprehension in the north extremely high south korea has a vested interest in receiving defectors rather than attempting to harm them but in order to come under south korea's protection a person first has to make it to south korea an extremely difficult proposition in itself because of how dangerous and well monitored the dmz is the vast majority of north korean defectors choose to attempt travel through china instead relations between the two countries may have become somewhat frosty but they are a hell of a lot better than the relations between the two Koreas, and about 80 percent of defectors choose to try their luck with these routes many plan to then flee to a third nation be it mongolia cambodia vietnam or elsewhere in order to find safe passage towards south korea or another more developed nation but even if a defector chooses to go to china their journey will still be perilous not least because of the exploitation and trafficking that many north koreans face once they arrive according to the korea future initiative as many as 80 percent of the young women and girls who flee from north korea into china are going to find themselves sold into sex slavery a shadow industry that generates tens of millions of dollars a year when defectors make it to china they typically find themselves in an area referred to as the red zone a zone where they'll still be hunted down by chinese authorities 
If captured, first-time offenders will typically catch a long sentence in a brutal North Korean prison camp, but repeat offenders are more likely to just be executed. Facing such harsh reprisals, even on foreign soil, many North Koreans are dependent on traffickers who get them across the border alive, but have near complete control on what happens to them afterward. With no money, no access to food, and no way to navigate a third country, defectors in China are at the mercy of whatever handlers they've chosen, and systematic rape, forced marriage, and sexual slavery are often the results. In this part of China, it's not unusual for North Korean women to be beaten publicly or sold for the equivalent of a few hundred dollars. Making matters worse. China's red zone is a blind spot for the international community. Very little information travels out, and when it does travel out, sending help is all but impossible. For those who are lucky enough to avoid these forms of slavery and indentured servitude, the next goal is getting the hell out of the red zone, either to a South Korean embassy or to another border nation, where all the risks of a border crossing have to be dealt with one more time. If they're found by Chinese authorities in the process, they risk deportation back home, where we know very little about what happens to them, but where we can assume they're treated with all the usual hostility of a pissed-off hermit kingdom. For those who do reach the end of this ordeal without capture, though, South Korea is usually the destination, otherwise it's Europe, Canada, Japan, Thailand, and the Philippines. Mongolia also has a clear policy in place to get them to South Korea, and the United States takes on a small number of defectors who usually settle in or around Koreatown and Los Angeles. Regardless of the path that an individual North Korean takes, getting out of their country is an incredibly dangerous task. Making it to the border is no guarantee. Hell, even making it out of one's village is an impressive feat on its own. But stepping across the border, that's only a fraction of the overall journey that most North Koreans have to make. And with so many potentially devastating outcomes, the fact that tens of thousands of people have gotten out successfully is just a remarkable feat in itself. Now, when it comes to the prospect of defecting from the North, we can only get so far by relating abstract accounts of the average defector's experience. In order to really get a sense of what a person may experience during their escape, we're going to have to focus on some individual stories, beginning with an unnamed defector who lent her story to George Washington University in 2018. Now, this particular refugee's journey began after a childhood spent living through famine, surrounded by friends who were forced to forage for barely edible grass or leave school in order to work themselves to death. After the unknown defector's family had their business confiscated, an outcome that happens often when individuals are found to own or control more wealth than the state allows, and our protagonist's mother passed away, she decided to brave a journey toward the South, disillusioned with the regime due to glimpses of South Korean life that she had gotten from smuggled in movies and books. Using a broker provided by her father, a defector crossed the Tumen River into China and was brought into the city of Yangji, where she was informed that she had already been sold to a wealthy Chinese man to be forced into marriage. But after two days kept in custody, she got lucky, escaping her captors and traveling China for ten months before making her way to Vietnam. There, realizing that she couldn't make it past Vietnamese guards around the South Korean embassy, she made an unsuccessful attempt to travel to Laos by hiding beneath the seats of a bus but was captured for her trouble. It would take several more months to make it to South Korea, first with the deportation to China and then two attempts to cross the Cambodian border. And finally, a year and a half after her journey began, she was able to reach South Korea and begin the resettlement process. Fortunately, some North Korean defectors are able to make their journeys more easily. For example, take a defector using the false name of David, who spoke to Sky News in April of 2023. David was lucky enough to make it to China, even despite the tighter border restrictions that have popped up since the COVID-19 pandemic, with the help of a bribe that his mother paid to a North Korean border guard. This is after his father had already fled to the south, and as retaliation, his mother had been taken to a labor camp, beaten relentlessly, and very nearly starved over the course of several years. After her release, she was able to get David on a path to follow his father to the south, and although the specifics of his journey have been kept confidential so as not to implicate the people who helped him in North Korea, he's been able to assimilate and live a relatively normal life in the south. Another relative success story is Park Song Mi, who was able to cross the border to China on the 31st of May 2019. When Park was just a toddler, she'd been brought on an attempted border crossing on her mother's bag, but her family was found at a relative's pig farm in China, where they'd hidden after getting across the Yalu River. After that, Parks' parents had been taken away to a prison camp, and though they were lucky enough to be released after about five years, her father died shortly after he was let go. Her mother, distraught, left again by herself, and 13 years after she was first captured, now at the age of 17, Park tried again. This time, her escape was financed by her mother, who paid the equivalent of tens of thousands of dollars in order to give her a safe crossing. Park spent the first leg of her trip moving alone at night through China, then rode a bus through the countryside to Laos, and finally she was able to make it to a South Korean embassy for a total of six months of processing. At the end of her journey, she was able to reunite with her mother, a rare modicum of a happy ending in a world where 
Happy endings are exceptionally hard to find. Now, on the darker end of the spectrum, as when we say darker, we mean much, much darker, we have the story of Lee Yu Mi, who escaped North Korea in 2014 by paying several hundred dollars to a broker who promised a job in a restaurant across the Chinese border. But despite his promises, this broker had been working with a trafficker organization that took informal custody of Lee once she reached the border. Once under their control, Lee was kept in an apartment with a number of other North Korean girls and used for cyber sex operations in which she was expected to video chat with a long list of paying customers. She was allowed to leave her apartment just once every six months and had no success in her attempts to escape. After five years of confinement, Lee came into contact with a South Korean online operation meant to rescue young women in her position. Luckily, Lee was eventually rescued and driven south until she reached the South Korean embassy in China. But a lucky break is typically not how these sorts of stories end. According to the London-based Career Future Initiative, Lee's experience is a common one and sometimes targets girls as young as nine. Similarly, there's the story of Kim Jong Ah, who fled to China in 2006 after a brief career as an army lieutenant in North Korea. Although Kim Jong Ah initially left her country due to tensions with her family, not disillusionment with the regime, she was smuggled across the Yalu River into China anyway, and once she arrived, she found herself within the grasp of her traffickers, who now intended to sell her into a coerced marriage. Kim could not prevent herself from being sold for the rough equivalent of just under $2,500. And while in her Chinese husband's care, she delivered a baby girl that she had conceived with her now ex-husband back in North Korea. After several years watching for signs that she might be repatriated by Chinese officials, Kim decided to risk a two-month trip to Myanmar before crossing the Myanmar border into Thailand and eventually finding her way to South Korea. But once there, Kim had been unable to regain custody of her daughter, who remained with her adoptive father in China. And finally, We'll close with the exceptional story of Kim Hyun Woo, who was a high-ranking intelligence official for North Korea before he defected in 2014. For 17 years prior to his defection, Kim had worked to track down and apprehend perceived hostile actors within North Korea. Meaning, for context, a person who, say, watched a contraband soap opera from South Korea or expressed disbelief when reminded that, according to North Korea, former dictator Kim Jong-il's body was so perfect that it had no need to defecate. After Kim Jong-un's rise to power in 2011 and the purges that tore through the country's intelligence apparatus, Kim Hun Woo decided to flee the country rather than be swept up in it. Unlike the stories that we've described so far, Kim Hun Woo was lucky enough to be a man of significant means by North Korean standards and was able to arrange an escape for his entire family because he was posted abroad at the time. But even for someone of his stature, he explains that there is no telling what may have happened to the family, friends, and subordinates he left behind. These are just a small fraction of the stories available to the Western world. And well, they account for only a small fraction of the possibilities around just how successful or just how disastrous an attempted escape can be. But most important of all is to remember that although we know of tens of thousands of successful defections in the past few decades, we have no idea of what the total number is, the number of people who tried to make that journey. Perhaps half of the North Koreans who wish to flee their country are able to do it, or perhaps it's closer to one in a hundred, we just don't know. And so at this point in the video today, that we'd like to be able to sign off with a note of hope about those who make it to South Korea. I mean, usually from an international observer's perspective, making it to that side of the Korean peninsula is all you'd need in order to declare a happy ending. But for most defectors from North Korea, arrival in the South isn't the end of the journey, it's just the start of another chapter, one that can be incredibly painful in its own way. And to explain it, I'll put it a bit simply. What if you went through the entire process just as we described, found your way from north to south despite the incredible danger, despite the abuses and tragedies that you suffered along the way, and then you found that your new life bears little resemblance to what you thought you'd find? Take the example of Kim Woo-ju, a former gymnast who escaped North Korea in November 2020. Although Kim managed to reach South Korea safely, we now know that he had a difficult time adapting to his surroundings, working as a nighttime cleaner in office buildings and otherwise living an extremely isolated existence in the South. Either unable or unwilling to make friends, Kim was practically unknown to his neighbors other than the simple fact of his existence, and after over a year in the South, he made the decision to make his DMZ crossing again, but this time he went in the opposite direction. In his apartment, Kim dragged his mattress and otherworldly possessions out to the street to be collected and set off toward the North Korean border. In an act caught on numerous security cameras, Kim scaled a high barbed wire fence and walked for two and a half miles across the DMZ, lucky enough not to step on any landmines in the process. In Seoul, 
South Korean officials were forced to acknowledge the reality of the situation. Kim hadn't been a spy, or if he was, it'd have collected zero useful intelligence. Instead, it simply grown disillusioned with South Korea and made the perilous journey back to the North, even despite the risks. And just saying there that Kim might have stumbled on a landmine would uh, badly be underselling the danger faced by returning. How North Korea would handle a defector who essentially turned himself in is entirely unknown, and given how the country typically handles signs of disloyalty, it is unlikely that Kim received a welcome home party for his trouble. Whether he got a slap on the wrist, or a sentence to a lifetime of hard labor, or a quick appointment with a firing squad, we just don't know. It's North Korea. Although returning to the North is rare among defectors, with just 30 or so examples out of some 35,000, it's simply not accurate to dismiss that sort of choice as insanity. As much as South Korea and the Western world would like to portray themselves as benevolent caretakers for those who have experienced hardship in the North, many defectors experience genuinely difficult conditions upon arriving to South Korea. The average monthly income for a North Korean defector is a fraction of what the average South Korean makes, in a country where even average South Koreans have trouble making ends meet. In 2021, 47% of North Korean defectors living in the South describe themselves as experiencing mental anguish, and often they have to contend with not just harassment at work, but isolation at home and in their communities. Coming from a place like North Korea, a defector will have basically zero transferable skills, and even if that defector might have been a successful worker for the North Korean regime or a member of the government, it's highly unlikely that they would ever secure a comparable job in the South. So too are social conventions radically different, and the status that a person may have had in the North carries absolutely no bearing in the South. For all the problems a North Korean citizen may endure, a lack of community typically isn't one of them. A young North Korean who misses their school classes, likely to see all their classmates outside their home to check in on them. A North Korean who moves to a new area isn't just encouraged, but they're required to get to know their neighbors. And that sense of community is replaced by small monthly subsidies and complete anonymity in South Korean starred cities. It can have a massive negative impact. Already fighting an uphill battle against housing, education, job discrimination, defectors now have to fight upward against their own mental health, a struggle that many people lose. Now, it's critical to recognize here that even though life in North Korea is worlds apart from what most of us could imagine in the West, some parts of that life provide safety and stability that the defector can't get anywhere else. In the words of Jewel Yong, who left North Korea with his mother and sister at the age of 13, quote, In North Korea, we didn't have to plan our lives. The state did that for us. But in the South, we have to take responsibility for our own lives. Now, to many of you watching this, you're probably thinking that, well, Jewel Yong sounds like he's describing freedom. To many defectors, though, freedom without knowing what to do with it is a burden. When a person arrives to South Korea, after completing their journey from the North, they begin a six-month process intended to vet them, assess their situation, and give them support when possible. For up to the first three months in the South, the defector will be sequestered in specialized facilities, debriefed and investigated by South Korean officials to ensure that they aren't spies or agents of the North Korean secret police. Once that's done, the defector will move to a facility called Hanawon, a school designed to teach them to assimilate into South Korean life. Topics range from Korean and world history to an explanation of South Korean culture and social norms to vocational tools to work low-skill jobs to a primer on everyday tasks like buying groceries, paying bills, or taking out the trash for collection. Hanawon is a mandatory step for any North Korean defector, meaning that defectors will often spend up to a total of six months in state custody before being allowed to resettle. And to hear many South Koreans activists tell it, Hanawon is a broken piece of a largely ineffective process. On the one hand, Hanawon is certainly well intention giving defectors a range of options between 22 types of mainly menial work to study and ensuring that they have the tools to navigate society, not just with information about their new home, but with cultural and social tools to understand what the hell everyone around them will be talking about. But on the other hand, many people who have been through the process describe it as a whole lot of nonsense. One defector interviewed by CNN described how he was taught to plate a ring with gold, while others pointed out that the facility seems to treat life in North Korea as a single stereotype without any effort to distinguish people who may have been favored citizens under the regime. Hanawon officials now say that their process has changed and that their subject matter has been reined in and reoriented toward giving defectors more useful information. But defectors and activists alike continue to emphasize the need for a more flexible, even tailored approach to individual North Koreans. After Hanawon, some defectors are able to link up with resettlement agencies and community centers where they're introduced to uh, people in their communities, given help acquiring a phone and a bank account, and checked in on in order to avoid the isolation that so often comes with resettlements. But this sort of community support 
is anything guaranteed and defectors who aren't lucky enough to be resettled in areas where they exist often find themselves shit out of luck a counselor may help them tidy up their new apartment and stock their fridge with a small box of food staples that comes with the key to their place but after that it's a uh, goodbye good luck Generally, defectors are checked in on by local police officers who may or may not connect them with other social services, but it's not uncommon that defectors at this stage begin to withdraw. Mental health support for these people does exist, but it's starkly limited in the South compared to the investment sent towards security vetting and re-education at Hanawon. As many as 15% of North Korean refugees in the South admit to having suicidal thoughts, three times the already high average among South Koreans, and many of them lack the tools to deal with the extreme trauma they suffered under the North Korean regime. Sometimes the weight's just too much to bear, even if a defector doesn't take their own life. In 2019, defector Han Song Ark and her son were found dead in their apartment in Seoul, where they were believed to have starved to death. All that the authorities found in their apartment was a bag of red pepper flakes in a wealthy city where any number of individuals might have given them help if only they'd known that such a problem existed. In a similar incident in 2022, a woman in her 40s who defected in 2002 was found dead and decomposing in her apartment, reduced to nearly a skeleton. She was found in October wearing winter clothes, suggesting to investigators that she may have died as long as a year before she was found. This after six years that this woman, who has remained unnamed, spent working to resettle others who fled the North. In South Korea, the reality for many defectors is unmistakable. Support is lacking, especially for mental health concerns, and where it does exist, it's often insufficient. Of all the things that South Korean authorities don't need to be generalizing at the Hanawon facility, one thing stands out as a generalization that could be helpful or even critical to make. In North Korea, mental health concerns are treated by sending a struggling person to remote hospitals in the mountains from which very few people ever return. After being aware of that sort of deterrent for their whole lives, it makes sense that a defector might not be eager to seek help in the South, and, and if they'll be treated better in the South, if they'll be hurt and treated with respect, then one would think that that message is an important one for Hanawon to deliver. And so as we end today's video, it's with an awareness of two difficult competing realities. Life in North Korea is brutal in every sense of the world. Do everything right, live perfectly as Kim Jong-un would wish, and you'll spend life halfway to starvation without reliable power or clean water, choking on a sheer volume of propaganda that would put most modern regimes to shame. But try and escape, and in many ways you'll exchange a grave set of circumstances for a nearly impossible task. Survive on the way out of North Korea, survive while crossing the DMZ or trying to navigate the lawless lands in northern China, and survive once you reach a world in South Korea that will, in many ways, be utterly alien. How do you escape North Korea? Well, you stay quiet and you say nothing of your intentions to your village, to your friends, even to your family. You disappear and you try to evade capture in the North Korean countryside. And if you do that, you get the dubious honor of being able to play whack-a-mole with the snipers at the border. Make it through, probably to China, and you'll navigate a harsh world with no money, no contacts, and a legion of China's own secret police looking for refugees to hunt down. You make it to another country and then to South Korea. You do your security checks, you do three months at Hanawon, you rely on luck and luck and luck and more luck. And after that, you hope beyond hope that nothing goes wrong. Nobody show Nobody stops you at the wrong moment, and nobody asks you a question you don't know the answer to. And if you can do all of that, your reward is to try and build a new life from nothing, a foreigner almost from another planet, even surrounded by people who are themselves just as Korean as you. It's a high price to pay in order to escape the Hermit Kingdom, but if you're forced to choose between this and life under the most tyrannical regime on the planet, we have to imagine that to many aspiring North Korean defectors, it seems like no choice at all.